welcome to Fusion Film Festival's 2017-2018 launch event. Um, we're your co-directors, Rachel Lambert, I'm Priya Colbert, and Caitlin Chad. And at the Fusion Film Festival, everything we do is fueled by our belief in women's creative voices. Fusion's mission is celebrating and empowering women in film, TV, and new media, as well as promoting gender collaboration in these industries. So just like you don't have to identify as a woman to be a feminist and to support women's rights, you don't have to identify as a woman or be a filmmaker to be a part of our film festival team. We're a group of passionate students united by a love for film as a powerful medium for social change, and we're determined to uplift voices and achieve equality. So thank you for being here with us today. We are a student-run film festival that holds events throughout the year with our main festival happening in the spring. This year, our festival dates are April 5th to 7th, 2018. As Fusion's Film Festival's stature and reputation has grown so tremendously in the industry, we are so thrilled and proud to be made a partner of the Allied, the allied Partner of the Women in Film Sundance Women's in Initiative. We are supported by Tusk, ProFunds, and the Canbar Institute of Film and Television. We have been so passionately supported and mentored in the entirety of the festival's life by NYU film professor and our faculty advisor, Susan Sadler. Hi, everyone. Um, one of the great initiatives this year at Fusion um, that I'm very excited about is something called Fusion Connect on our beautiful website where you'll be able to see next week uh, all the information about submissions which will be opening next week in 15 categories. Um, we're also starting something called Fusion Connect that will allow female DPs to showcase their reels so that people looking for incredible talent can come to Fusion's website and meet cinematographers to employ in their projects. It'll be a wonderful way to bring all kinds of new projects to Fusion. Look for our submission information next week. Spread the word. We have incredible prizes from Canon to Movado to Avid, uh, $60,000 in prizes. It's a thrilling festival, and we want to see you there in the spring for that. And lots of events coming up between now and then. Fusion grows filmmakers, but it also grows leaders. And that's who you're meeting tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you, Susan. This is Fusion's 16th year, and we're so thrilled to be announcing the opening of festival submissions period of November 1st through February 19th with the screening of the award-winning win film, Signature Move, directed by Jennifer Reeder and written by Fazia Mirza and Lisa Donato. Fazia, who is also the star of the film, will be here tonight for a Q&A following the screening. Visit our website, fusionfilmfestival.com, starting November 1st, for live links to submission applications and information on eligibility, categories, and prizes. And now, without further ado, we present Signature Move. Hi. Yeah, that should always happen. Hi. Yes! <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. How'd you guys like the movie? Woo! You have to say that, but thank you. <laughs> you don't have to say anything, because that matters. Oh, yeah. This is Fazia Mirza. She just came here. She's been traveling so much, so thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad you're here. Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, so first question, Okay. how did you transition from being a lawyer to being a filmmaker? Uh, very difficult. Uh, <laughs> my, uh, God, how did I transition? I don't know, like the journey itself was uh, long, but um, the way it happened was that I loved, you know, performing and, you know, I was in all the things like drama classes and band and all that stuff when I was a kid. But when it came time, and I was an English major in college, and then when it came time to like, you know, my parents were like, you know, Fawzia, you have to be serious now. You know, no more acting. That was a good <laughs> hobby. And so I was like, all right. So they were like, you know, now what are you gonna do with your life? And so, you, you are you gonna get married? Are you gonna get an education? 
And I said, I don't want to get married, so I will get an education. And I went to law school um, because I didn't know what else to do with my life, which is actually one of the top five reasons they tell you not to go to law school. So I did that. And um, it was actually um, my third year of law school that I did this thing called trial advocacy, which is kind of like these competitions, like you're learning courtroom stuff. So it's like opening and closing arguments and all this really dramatic, cool things that you see on shows and movies. Like none of that's really real. It's just acting, and um, and that's what I liked. And so um, yeah, I promised myself I would take some classes, and so I did. And so I still took the bar exam, um, but then started taking acting classes and realized that my most marketable skill to have a job and make money and pay back my law school loans was being a lawyer. So I uh, started lawyering by day and um, taking improv and um, acting classes at night. And then, um, yeah, eventually left that to do almost like another changing career because then I did a comedy educational touring show um, that was sort of an anti-sexual uh, assault. Uh, show and so it toured to colleges around the country and military installations around the world and um, that so I left being a lawyer to have that job full-time and then also be an artist and when I could and then it's been about the last five years that I've been full-time acting writing and creating stuff oh, Wow! so when you told your parents go I, on <laughs> this is, is what my I'm mom doing. here mom <laughs> <laughs> Where, how, how did they take it? What, what did they say when you were like, I'm going to go into the arts now? Uh, Fazia, what are you talking about? <laughs> Fazia, you're mad. Uh, no, they were, they were, you know, they were not happy. They were like, you're a lawyer. That's good. Being an artist, you will make no money. That's bad. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's true. I have no clue how this is going to happen. Um, because you think about doing something, and the way I've sort of lived and survived is do it and, and figure it out mm -hmm. as you're doing it, um, which is not what I recommend for everybody, but it can work for some of us. Um, and so, yeah, they were not happy at all, and I definitely, I talk about the fact that I became an actor not in the easiest way, which was on a lawyer's debt. And, um, you know, I, one of the biggest pieces of advice I give to people is, like, know why you're doing something, you know? Like, if you're not sure what you want to do right now, it's okay, wait. You know, you don't have to have the answer right now. Um, so, yeah, they were totally unhappy. My, they were just like, what are we going to tell our family? What are we going to tell the community? What are we going to tell uh, your dead ancestors? <laughs> Although then when I came out as a lesbian, I think they were like, okay, you can be an actor. <laughs> just, just, just be a straight actor. It's fine. Oh, it's fine. <laughs> so you worked with your co-writer, Lisa Tomato, on a short previous to this film. Um, what was that experience like? And then how did you collaborate on this? Like, how did that come about? So Lisa Donato is an amazing human being who also was in advertising and then transitioned into full-time artistry because everything she would do in the ad world was like, we're going to make a movie of this commercial or this branding. And so um, she made her first short, short film called Sugar Hiccup and um, cast me in it. And we had just this really great um, creative connection on set. and. Um, that kind of is everything to me, whether as a creator or as a human being walking and moving through life, is when you feel an energy with somebody, like it's not just random, it means something. It's not necessarily romantic, it just means that you're supposed to maybe know them or work with them or, you know, something is meant to happen. So um, later on, uh, like a year or so later, um, I had this written this short film called Signature Move and um, I wanted to turn it into a feature and a friend of mine, um, who actually one of the producers, was like, you should do it, this is what you want to do. And so I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to turn it into a feature, but I've never done this before, I don't know how to do this. Boy, I should work with somebody to do this. And so I thought, who would be crazy enough to work with me on this? And so I called Lisa Donato, and I said, hey, so there's this like workshop lab deadline in seven days, do you want to fly to LA with me where I live? and make a feature, and write a feature for it. And she said, sure. 
which is insane. And so we wrote our first draft in a week, and that was how it all kind of started. And then, you know, over the next year and a half, we we did a lot of revisions. You know, there was actually a ton that was actually cut out just because of our budget and time and, you know, director's style and things like that. But, um, yeah, that's kind of how it all began. We made another short film called Spunkle, um, which is about two women who ask one of the brothers to be their sperm donor, their uncle. Spunkle. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, but so yeah, uh, so we worked on that, and now we're kind of collaborating on um, just a, a range of other crazy things, and hopefully, you know, writing a lot more together. So if this isn't too personal of a question, nothing I do is personal. Great. <laughs> <laughs> How much of the film? and your character, Zena, reflects your own life experience? Because I know when I was watching it, I was sitting here and I was like, that's so true. That's exactly <laughs> what my mom would say. That's exactly what would happen. So like, for you, like, how much is the character you or you the character? I, get, I mean, I definitely am inspired by things that I see or I experience or things that I see my friends experience. So I feel like all of the things I create are somehow personal, very personal. Um, this is extremely personal in the respect that the relationship between Zainab and Alma, it's inspired by me, you know, actually falling in love with this amazing Mexican woman um, who's my ex. Uh, but don't worry. <laughs> we are still best friends. Oh yeah. I, uh, I actually, she's getting married uh, and... Uh, <laughs> The plot thickens. <laughs> she is uh, to a man. <laughs> She's like, if I can't have Fozzie, I want no woman. <laughs> no, it's not that at all. I'm just being silly. Um, uh, <laughs> but she is. Just today, I said, well, look, I need to know, am I involved in your wedding or what? And she said, just show up in Tuscany, August 31st. And I was like, all right, fine. I know, that's... It's still very dramatic. Um, but anyway, we when we started dating in the city of Chicago, like we actually did fall in love in this beautiful summer in the city. And, you know, people are often so quick to find these lacking of similarity between people and cultures and communities. And through our relationship, I just found that we have so much in common, like our food and our mothers and our family and our language and just... Um, you know, our mango and cilantro, you know, there was just so much that connected us. And so I, I felt like that felt really important to talk about. Um, and I know we sort of experienced this as a, as a global community right now as well, but, you know, in the city of Chicago, it's this deeply diverse city that's deeply segregated. And, um, you know, it's a city that has one of the largest populations of South Asians and Mexicans anywhere in the country and yet so divided where people don't go to another neighborhood. And so you have, you know, what you see in the movie is Devon Avenue, which is on the north side of Chicago, far north side, which is like little South Asia, and then you have uh, Little Village, which is kind of little Mexico, which is on the southwest side. Very, very far away, but feel so connected just by how much is actually shared, at least in our experiences. Um, I did not ever wrestle as a pro. I never actually wrestled professionally ever <laughs> outside of for this film, um, but that was inspired because I met um, a former pro wrestler on a late night comedy talk show I was on in Chicago for another project, and it was this former pro WWE wrestler named Lisa Marie Verone, and she performed her finishing move or her signature move on the show on like this like super broy like man host, and I was like, oh my god, she's gonna own this guy. This is awesome. <laughs> And she performed it, and right before she did, she said the line, don't move, because I don't want to get hurt, you know? And I was like, oh my god, this woman is amazing. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how has feminism, or how have our stories forgotten about these women? You know, where are they in all this? So it just seemed like another connection to create across, you know, the South Asian character and, you know, this Mexican family, um, and bringing in this, this story of these women um, and putting a twist on the Muslim character. <laughs> I know whose turn it is. <laughs> so this film Go on, I'm listening. <laughs> How do you feel about the 
feel about the current state of the LGBTQ community being represented in film, TV, and new media? Because this is like a wonderful depiction of a relationship between two women, but like, do you feel like the media is showing more of that, or is it still like stereotypical portrayals, or how do you feel about it? Well, I guess, you know, the reason I started writing was actually because, you know, you go into a casting room, especially, you know, in Chicago where I was living, and, you know, I sort of lived between Chicago and L.A., but when I would go into a room in Chicago, it's like, oh, we're looking for somebody South Asian, but not somebody South Asian like me. You know, they wanted my friends, like, long hair, like, super, super sexy, you know? Priyanka Chopra, you know, that's who they, they wanted Quantico a South Asian woman, you know? Uh, I get it, I mean, she's Miss World, like, who doesn't want to be cast her or whatever? I was about to say something else inappropriate. That was right. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, um, and so, um, uh, yeah, or I'd go in for a, a queer role, a lesbian role, but I wasn't like the right kind of lesbian, you know, um, for TV, or I wasn't like Muslim enough. And so it sort of got exhausting thinking, okay, I am all these things, but I'm not enough to play myself. So I thought, well, why am I, what am I waiting for? And then also I didn't, I didn't see those stories of this intersectional world, or even accurate depictions of one world told deeply authentically or by authentic voices. So um, I thought, well, why not just start creating them? And um, so that was kind of the impetus for, for writing more. In terms of what you see now, I think it's gotten better, <laughs> you know? And like anything, like even like all of us as individuals, I think we always can do better and be better and evolve. And, you know, I think they're, you know, even like The Bull Type, I think, is a great example of a show depicting, oh, I was like, somebody clapping, no, you're fine. <laughs> uh, you're like, cute trailer! <laughs> um, but, but that's a great example of a show where, you know, you see this Muslim queer woman, and so that's really exciting, and she like has sex. And you're like, oh, so this like Muslim queer character is like gonna have sex and that's so exciting. So she's a woman with agency. And could it go further? Definitely, for sure. It's I there no, were no Muslims writing that role. Uh, there were no um, people of color writing that role. So um, you know that authenticity has a long way to go. But but yeah, I think there's a lot of space. Um, and also, you know, you see the South Asian voices out there. I think there's mostly still male straight South Asian voices. So um, I think there's a lot of room and I think there's a lot of need and um, I think there's a lot of space, but I definitely am a proponent of like creating your own work because then you know, you have less people to answer to. Um, and uh, yeah, you can make whatever you want then. Keeping you on your toes, it's fine. I know! <laughs> I was gonna ask you. Um, but your character in the film is struggling to come out to her mother. Um, what would your advice be to someone who's maybe coming to terms with their identity and their sexuality and has yet to come out or is in the process of doing so? So I, um, you know, the phrase coming out to me is something that I feel like is a really Western concept and Western term. And, um, really doesn't take into account true like intersectionality because you know me growing up it's like okay you know I wasn't allowed to drink or date boys or go to prom or like you know wear certain kinds of clothes like so it was like well what am I gonna come out about I'm like not allowed to do any of that and then suddenly I'm gonna be like mom I'm having sex with women she'd be like what <laughs> when did you learn that word <laughs> So it's kind of like, there's a lot, there's a, there's a much more complicated space I think that we inhabit and that many people inhabit and I think more of us are intersectional than we think we are. We are more than just one thing, all of us. And so um, I think, you know, and, and part of that speech that Zainab gives is inspired by, you know, I remember dating someone who was like, well listen, just write your mom a letter. I was like, what? <laughs> You're gonna write my mom a letter? <laughs> mom? I'm a lesbian. <laughs> By the way, I don't know why I would have an accent pickup, but I just did. But 
like, well, like that just didn't make sense to me, you know? Like my mom and I didn't talk about, and still we don't talk about things. So, so I think that what I learned is, is and, and part of it was through creating art and it was finding my voice and what that means and finding an identity or this old transcending, you know, this noise. Everybody wants to tell you how to be, right? Um, I don't think anyone's coming out narrative is going to be the same as anybody else's. And I think that's completely okay. We all come from different towns and cultures and religions and families and communities. And, you know, that affects who we are. And I don't think it's safe for everybody to come out. And safe also means different things to different people. Um, and so, you know, eventually, I mean, I came out to my mom, whatever that means, over Gchat, you know. I know, believe me. God. <laughs> And she didn't get it at first. She's like, no, Fuzzy, it's okay. You'll find new friends. And I'm like, Mom, she wasn't my friend. She was my girlfriend. We were dating. Pause, pause, pause. Well, that was a bombshell. <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story. It's a true story. It's in a play, in my play. I wrote about it. And you know what I mean? And so, and then she had a very, you know, she recoiled and, you know, we didn't talk for a while. But, you know, now we're at the point where she knows I have a girlfriend. She knows we live together. We don't talk about it. Recently, for the first time, she said, well, you're a friend. And I was like, wow, we are progressing. <laughs> this is great. Um, but I'm not going to change her and she's not going to change me. And so I think that, you know, when we're thinking about how do you come out? What do you do? I think it's relative. And, you know, part of what was important for these characters was the mom coming to the wrestling match and Zena telling her I wrestle. These are steps. These are moments. These are conversations. And in these little phrases, there's so much unsaid that says a lot. And I don't think everyone, you know, and, and in some ways the, the Mexican mother and daughter that's like the dream that I always wanted, right? That's like the romantic mother-daughter relationship. Am I ever gonna have that? No. Um, do I wish I had it still? I think I've gotten past that now. But I wanted it for a long time and I was really angry I didn't have it. So for me, like writing about my mom a lot of times is reconciling the life I have and the relationship I have. And, um, you know, I don't think everybody can do that, and right? I don't think it's safe for everybody to do that, but for me, like, I look at my mother, and she literally, like, you know, I call, she's like a little weeble, like a little Russian doll weeble. I don't know why I think of a Russian doll, but, like, that's what she is, and she wears her hijab, and she's, like, cute, and, you know, she prays a lot, and she reads the Quran, and watches a lot of dramas on YouTube, or on her iPad, like, she'll be, like, sleeping with the iPad right there. And so when we hang out, sometimes I'm hanging, laying next to her, watching her, vi you know, YouTube videos. Which sometimes are in Turkish. And I'm like, Mom, do you know what they're saying? And she's like, no, but Fazia, it's so good. <laughs> like, all right, Mom. And then I watch, and I'm like, oh my god, she's right. That's so good. You know? <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, I, we look at us, and I look like, you know, Eric Estrada meets Bruno Mars, right? <laughs> and then you have her. And we just are exactly alike, you know? like all of my energy and drive and craziness comes from her. And, you know, again, it's like this exterior is just a shell. Everything is, is inside. And so, yeah, I know that's not a quick answer. So I just feel like do what you have to do. And um, I think, you know, it takes time and process and process is beautiful. Um, so don't let anyone tell you how to do and be who you are, you know? It'll come, with, come to you, you just sort of have to listen to yourself. But yeah, just step away. <laughs> Got it. Well, really, like going off of that, how, when you were growing up, how did you balance the Western and Eastern culture? And then has that changed? How do you, like, how do you balance that now? Especially for, like, people who might be like first generation Americans or like, like for example, my parents born and bred in India and I was born and raised in Iowa and that's different. <laughs> so yeah. how do you balance all of that? Um, you know, I grew up not liking where I came from. You know, I wanted my name to be Jessica. I really did. <laughs> I wanted like, like these green eyes and red hair. So I wanted to be Irish. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, I just dreamt. I do. I, I made up for that by drinking a lot of whiskey at different points in my life. No, like that's so relatable. Like that's so relatable. <laughs> the whiskey or the Irish? Both. Great. <laughs> Brown girls, you know. Um, but um, I think that um, you know it took me a really long time. I grew up in Sydney, Nova Scotia, Canada, which is not very diverse. Um, I grew up being the brown kid, um, wishing I celebrated Christmas. You know, I remember getting, like, a, for Christmas, a friend gave me, like, the brown doll. <laughs> as, and I was like, God, I just want the white one. <laughs> but, you know, and I, and I think it took me a long time. It wasn't until I moved to the U.S. and met other people that looked like me that I learned to, to love me, you know, and I think self-love is a huge part of happiness. I think it's a central part of happiness. Um, you know, like, the, I, like for, I, it actually wasn't even until five years ago. I used to have like a, a fake name for when I ordered, <laughs> ordered. Like, so it was like you, at Starbucks, it's like, what's your name? Darcy. <laughs> <laughs> that was my order name. You know, because it's annoying. Everyone looks at you. And they're like, what? How do you spell that? Oh, God. What? Can you say it again? No, I just want to be free. And so, you know, when you're younger, it's just so annoying. And, you know, you just feel weird. And you're like, you know, I had so many, like, checks that said, pizza, late night, Darcy. <laughs> Maybe my mom one day was like, Fazia, who's Darcy? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> But, you know, and, and, and even though I came so far as a human being, it really wasn't until five years ago that I was like, I, I, you know what, this is a form of activism. I'm going to start using my own name. It is time. People need to learn Fazia. It is such a common name where I come from. Or my, I come from Nova Scotia. My family comes from. You know, and so um, uh, it's, I think it's a hard balance. I think it's a very Western um, struggle. You know, it's a very diasporic struggle to have this this identity of East and West, and sometimes people have even more than just the two, you know. Um, uh, so I think it's, you have to know what you want. Um, and I, I, I don't say that lightly, I think it takes time, but I came to a place where I was like, you know, my first short film I made, it's called The Queen of My Dreams, three minutes long, and it was literally a reconciliation of being, can I be gay and be brown and Muslim at the same time? Because I thought you could not. Because to me, it was like, okay, I'm gay now. So I wear what my girlfriend's wearing. You know, it's like those pants, hang out with those people, go to those bars, listen to that music. And I was like, wait, but God, I love classic Bollywood. I love Sharmila Tagore. I love... Um, my Muslim culture and food and yeah I don't pray a lot but like I love how everyone you walk in a mosque and everyone's like take off your shoes put cover your hair no 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 go over here and eat eat and I'm like okay what sure you know there's something beautiful about it and I you know and and so I've gotten to a place where everybody will tell you doesn't matter if they're progressive people, all have opinions about some part of you. Like, it's deeply problematic that you are in a lot, in queer communities, and they don't think it's feminine, the hijab is not feminist. And I'm like, well, if a woman chooses to wear a hijab versus a woman choosing to wear high waisted pants, how is that different? You know, and so it's like, to me, it's like literally the same thing. So it's like, if you are in a community of people who don't embrace, some part of you, you have to embrace it. Um, so I felt like I had to transcend the noise of all these different communities and just kind of create my own space that felt safe to me. And there are plenty of people who are like, you can't be Muslim and lesbian at the same time. And I'm like, hi, <laughs> I'm right here. Like, I'm not a hologram. <laughs> you can. <laughs> um, and so um, I think it's tough. I think it's, but it's a matter of figuring out what you want for who you are. Like, do you want to learn your language? Do you want to wear certain clothes? Do, do you care about that? And you might not, and that's okay too. Um, so yeah, I think we're all kind of different than our parents. It's a matter of like finding out what you want to keep. What's theirs that you don't want and what's theirs that you do. Um, yeah. I'm just gonna say that my sisters and my 
name at Starbucks was always Serena. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's amazing. amazing. And then we were just like, no, this is ridiculous. Like, we have names. I mean, it is quite powerful that it's Serena, though. Uh, you know, there's going to be like Sir Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> a great thing if like all of us tomorrow went to a start well you don't have to go to Starbucks go to your local coffee shop support local and <laughs> we know Starbucks burns coffee uh, but we're all what's your name Beyonce <laughs> representation for people of color, specifically for South Asians, and you did touch on this earlier, but South Asians who did not necessarily grow up in Asia. Um, how do you feel about this like state of representation in media and culture today? Because as you said before, it's usually like straight South Asian men mm -hmm. who are representing us, but like, what do you have to say about that? Um, so I think, oh, I had a really good thought and I lost it. What do, I know, what do I have to say about that? Uh, what, let's ask it, can you ask him that again? Yeah. <laughs> so. Do over. <laughs> um, how do you feel about the representation of South Asians who didn't necessarily grow up in South A in Asia? Um, and their representation in media and so I mean I think you know it's inter I think like it's changing partially because you know as more and more people are here and as there's more job opportunities and as like there's a younger generation it, they're viable jobs you know you can you can see like oh you can make a living as a gamer or you can make a living as um, a writer or as an artist or as an actor um, and so or you know or as a director so those things are possible now um, I uh, I think that we're like we, it, it was fascinating to be like the hot you know we're the hot um, race you know it's like ooh a brown person yeah because we weren't for a while you know and then suddenly we were we're hot and I feel like definitely I know it's weird maybe but you know post 9/11 there's like a huge change in how the media was representing um, not just Muslims but people of color and you know, people from the Middle East, people from South Asia. I mean, before 9-11, if I said, where, where, where are you from? I'd be like, oh, Pakistan. They're like, what is that? What is that? And I'm like, oh, it's by India. And they're like, oh, I know India. <laughs> I love Indian food. And I'm like, that doesn't make us friends. <laughs> That's not a thing. You know? um, but after 9-11, everybody's like, I know Pakistan. <laughs> Why do you say it with an accent? Why do you say your country with an accent? It's Pakistan. Like, no, actually, it's Pakistan. No. So, I mean, I think that, um, I think that, like, over time has shifted slowly, slowly, and obviously there was a lot of, you know, really negative depictions of, like, terrorists um, and, ca and, you know, cab drivers where it's just like, this is all we are. We don't have agency as characters. We are just these, like, deeply, not even two-dimensional, often, like, half-dimensional pe people in, in, in anything represented. So I think it's changing a lot. And I think, like anything, the more that we start being at the table, the more our voices are represented. So the more, I mean, that's why I think the arts are so important. It's not just, it's like we start, like, people are influenced by media. And in order for us to be represented authentically, we also have to be depicting ourselves as directors, as writers, as uh, creators, as visionaries. We have to be at the table making those stories happen and telling those stories. And, and also it's a way to change policies as well. I mean, art can truly change policy and politics. And, and, and so I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's great, but it's, there's just a lot, more, a lot more work to do. And I mean, that's not just for you know, South Asian people, it's women, you know, I mean, we're, we are still struggling to, uh, you know, there's, you can have a man who makes a short that goes to Sundance, and then suddenly he'll be given a huge blockbuster film to direct in Hollywood, a woman will do the same thing, and it'll be like, I don't know if she's ready yet, let's give her a web series, you know, it's like, all right, fine, and that's still happening regularly, so again, it's why I just, I just really believe in, in 
if you have something to say, say it and, and create something and, and find some great collaborators to make it with that believe in you and, and you believe in them. Um, so looking at especially today's social and political climate, mm -hmm. um, I think there's a lot of people that are informed, but they want to know how they can make a change. And you do a lot of activism and activism in your work. So what would you say to those people that feel like, um, what can I do to make a difference? I mean, I, you know, I sort of call it artivism. I feel like everything that I make, even if it seems like deeply comedic, has something going on, even if it's the way you're casting. You know, like you can cast a way that feels progressive and changing the narrative because what people see is what they'll start getting used to or who they see. Um, you know, what, what, what we talk about as being deeply radical with Signature Move is that it's radical in the respect that it's literally so normal. There's no exotification of anybody, not Muslim people, not brown people, not Mexican people, not lesbians. There's no like, the male gaze is not depicting how women hook up, you know? And so, um, uh, you know, it's like, well, when do you get to see a Muslim woman who's not like the mother who's like evil? She's just a woman who's kind of lonely and trying to figure herself out as well as her daughter. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of politics, I feel like a lot has changed since um, in the last year and a half, obviously, especially since the election. I know I think about making things differently. Um, I also think that we have space. I think like satire feels really powerful to me. Um, you know, like when Donald Trump was saying really egregious things, um, hateful things about Muslims, um, people were like, oh, it's fine. The Muslim ban is not going to be a real thing because he won't be president. Um, and people weren't taking any of that seriously, and that felt really confusing to me. And so in December 2015, I was like, okay, well, what can I do as an artist? You know, I'm like a tiny lesbian, you know, <laughs> like I don't have a lot of power um, or resources. So I was like, well, why don't I make something? Because I started thinking, well, what, why is he so angry? Why does he hate Muslims so much? I was like, oh my God, why does somebody sometimes hate somebody so much? It's because they fell in love with somebody of that background. and. They got mad, they broke up, they went through a bad breakup. So I thought Donald Trump must have dated a Muslim woman. <laughs> he must have loved a Muslim woman, you know what I'm saying? And they must have had a baby, and they must have had to cover it up. So then I did a thing called The Muslim Trump, which is a mockumentary about Donald Trump's illegitimate Muslim daughter, <laughs> whom I played. <laughs> Her name is Aisha. <laughs> yeah, she's there. And, and again, you know, and so that was the thing where, you know, it was got some great press and, um, but, you know, then those same people were like, I love this. And then we talked about, let's make it a series and it pitched it. They were like, well, he's not going to win the election. So this is dead in the water. And so what I find fascinating is that there's a lot of opportunities for us to comment on current events, on politics. And I think we should take them um, because sometimes people aren't. And like I said, I think things are really different now, and it's really beautiful to see. You know, one of my favorite comedians is Harry Kondabolu, and you know, literally every day on Twitter, he's like, day 277 of Trump's presidency. Hashtag, this is not normal. You know? <laughs> and we have these platforms, use them. You know, you have all these fantastic resources to make stuff, use them. Um, yeah. Great. So. What's next for you? Either your projects that are in the works or your aspirations for the future? My aspirations for the future. Well, if we're up to my mom, it's marriage <laughs> to a man. Uh, for me, um, I wrote a one woman play called Me, My Mom, and Shermila. And that is, we're tr I turned that into a screenplay with um, a, a different writer, Terry Samundra. And uh, we're I hope to make that in the next, you know, couple years, two years, I guess. And that's exciting. We were named finalists for the San Francisco Film Society uh, Rainin Fellowship, Screenwriting Fellowship, which is exciting. Um, thank you. We'll find out in the next two weeks what happens next. Um, that's a thing I'm working, um, yeah, wanting to write maybe uh, with my co-writer, uh, Lisa Donato, be in a writer's room, um, so working on that kind of thing out um, in LA, writing a TV pilot, pitching a pilot. Uh, I have a docu-series 
which I'm pitching tomorrow morning, actually. Um, no big deal. Pray for me. <laughs> no, I mean it. <laughs> no, I don't, if you want to. Uh, what else? Uh, yeah, I'm kind of always kind of uh, thinking and scheming. I want to make a, an improv feature um, kind of outside of the system with very little money in two days. I don't know. Let's see if that happens. Um, yeah, I have a short doc that's on the festival circuit right now. Um, signature move will be on Amazon sometime in December. And yeah. Ooh, yes! <laughs> um, yeah, and I'm going to my brother's wedding in Pakistan mm. in December. Hey, hope to make a weird short film there while I'm there. Let's see. Uh, but that's that's it. And trying not to be a bad girlfriend in the process. Oh. <laughs> I, I mean, because I'm gone a lot. I'm traveling a lot. Can we open up the questions? Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Open for questions. Yes, does anyone have any questions? Uh, let's start with you in the back in the white sweatshirt. Does your mom watch your stuff? Does my mom watch my stuff? If I were, if we were in an airport together and I was like, Mom, I have to go to the bathroom, can you watch my stuff? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> she definitely would watch my stuff. Anything else that I make? No. no and you know, I, 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 I would maybe ask her to come to a party or an event, but it's just not her thing. I mean, she wouldn't like to see me rolling around with a woman or with anybody. <laughs> She'd be like, Fonzie, I've been to learn to kiss. <laughs> Cause like growing up, like I never saw my parents kiss. Like the most I ever saw them do was like, can I demonstrate? Yeah. Well, and like my dad to my mom would be like, well, that's your mom. <laughs> <laughs> like that was intimacy. <laughs> so, you know, but no, she saw me do one play once um, and she cried and it was lovely, and I mean, she could, I guess, if she clicked on something else on the internet instead of her soap operas, but no, she hasn't. And Uh, I think one of the most beautiful things was to make something, like to take something from uh, paper and the biggest thing that I've ever made and make it and see it happen. I mean, that feels like a privilege and a real like gift, you know? I know maybe that sounds cliche, but it really is. Um, and also working with um, a film legend, Shabana Azmi. She's like the Meryl Streep of India. Um, I got to celebrate Diwali with her in Mumbai a week ago, which is crazy. Uh, <laughs> Very crazy. Um, yeah, so that was something I never thought would happen. Um, and she is one of those people that you work with and you're like, oh my God, you make me better. And I just feel lucky to be around you. Um, and to watch somebody work like that who just, you know, and obviously this is as an actor, but to work with anybody who just knows, they just know, you know? Um, like she just knew every look, how her body moved. She was just so, grounded in every moment and scene and can do comedy and drama just effortlessly. I could watch her cut a papaya for days. Um, so that was really amazing. Um, what was hard, there was a lot of things that were hard. Um, I am a bit of a workaholic, um, but also, um, you know, sort of relinquishing the space of the producerial space and being an actor and trusting your director. Um, it was amazing because Jennifer Reeder is an amazing filmmaker. And um, this is kind of a stretch, not a stretch, but you know, she doesn't do this kind of, she's never done anything she didn't write before. And her shorts have gone to like, they've been at the Whitney's, they've been at Sundance and Berlinale. And um, she's just so wonderful. And, but she, you know, I, I trust her. I, tr I trusted her and I trust her. So, but that's still a hard space to enter into. Um, and I think making your first anything is hard. Uh, so I, I, you see all the mistakes or the lumps, um, and so you're just like, next time, I'll be back, you know? Yeah. 
Yes. Uh, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh my god, that's the best reaction ever. <laughs> to be called on? Yes. Um, so thank you so much for filming in Chicago and like I'm from Chicago and it's just yes! I never see you. like oh I love the hideout. Um but anyway, so I yes. just wanted to know like a little bit more about your relationship with Chicago and like did you grow up there? Like how did you see this film playing out in Chicago? Like how did that happen? So I've been there 17 years, um, and I went to move there for law school, and uh, I've been there a while, uh, obviously. I went to L.A. for a year. I came back to make this movie. Um, I, you know, it's one of those cities that is, you know, it is very, like, friendly. It's, like, diverse and lovely and problematic and segregated, and it's got this water and this man-made beach that's confusing, um, <laughs> but it's great because it's a beach. Um, but it's, um, there's just so many different kinds of people there and so many untold stories. And it's a great place to make work because right now is when so much is being filmed there. Before that, it was not, you know? And, and people, you know, and also when you think of the city of Chicago, like telling a story about Chicago, like normally people are like, oh, it's, a, it's winter, it's cold, it's a story of politics or of Al Capone, you know, or it's not been a story of women a city of women. It's not been a story of women of color. It's not been a story of these kinds of women or queer women or queer people. And so it was really important to me to tell a story of Chicago that was as diverse and robust and beautiful and sunny as, um, as a place that I know it to be and a beautiful place to fall in love. Um, and it's obviously deeply complicated, um, but you know, you. You can you can show these kinds of people there and these kinds of humans and women. Um, but yeah, I love the city. I think it's a great place to be, and I think it's a great place to go and make stuff. It's it's a place you can go. Like I feel like LA is a place you walk into and you're like, I want to sh film something here, and they're like, great, that'll be like five grand, and they don't even know what you're making, right? You're like it's just for my, you know, BFA. <laughs> they're like, I don't care. And then or in New York, you're like trying to film something on your Instagram and they're like, get that on my face. I don't want to be on camera. And you're like, sorry. And in Chicago, everyone's just like, come on in. <laughs> yeah. You want to use my bar? That's great. I would love for you to use this as a location. Can I be in it? Yeah, as an extra, I'll stay here all day. You know, and that's starting to change, but that's, you know, there's still that beautiful thing that happens there. And so there's that community, um, and it's it's still a little insular, but, you know, Dick Wolf has made it his home. <laughs> made a lot of shows there. We always joke in Chicago, we're like, what's next? Uh, Chicago uh, Waste Management, you know? <laughs> we're like, what's he, what's he going to make next there? But, yeah, it's a great place to make stuff. The rest, like why wrestling and how did you prepare for that? So mentally the rest, yeah, sorry. Mentally and physically. Um, the wrestling, I think there's, I don't know, I mean, there's a great metaphor, maybe it's a, not a great metaphor, but I think we're all wrestling with something. Um, but then um, the wrestling, it just felt like a really fun spin. You know, everyone expects, not everyone, but I think typically you see a Muslim character and they're going to be this one thing, and so it just felt really fun to give the Muslim character something else, this other thing, because I know I have other things, and we all have other things, so why can't this character? Um, and, uh, you know, then it felt like another connection to the Mexican family if I created, like, this lucha storyline. Um, I was kind of inspired on the on the Mexican side by this, the, one of the first female lucha libre uh, wrestlers, luchadoras, um, is a woman named Irma Gonzalez, and she lives in Mexico City. And I watched this documentary about this woman, and I was like, oh my god, she is so amazing. And even at like 80, she's like in the gym, like in a unitard, like pumping iron. And I'm like, oh my god, she could beat me up. You know? <laughs> and um, originally, the script actually had a grandmother and a mother, and then we switched it for the actress because she's so powerful. And we just made it a mom, wrote a mother. Um, and the other part was, how did I prepare? I, uh, as I said, don't wrestle, didn't wrestle, still cannot wrestle. Um, uh, but I worked out a lot. 
to be strong enough not to get hurt. <laughs> um, so I did all the moves that Zenob does, but I was, you know, I had a body double uh, stunt person who took all the really, really hard hits um, because I would maybe not make it through some of them. <laughs> um, and I guess that's something to think about, right? Like, I've never worked with stunts before. You know, we had an awesome stunt coordinator, Christian Litke, and he works on, like, all the big shows that shoot in Chicago. And he did all the choreography, and he worked with these amazing women. And um, it was like, you, unless you are trained enough, you actually should not ever do that because you are risking your body and you're risking the project. Hopefully body over project is first. But um, yeah, so it was it was awesome and it was it's so beautiful, like this form of art that we get to do. You do something you would never do in real life or get to do. So Kelsey, will you bring absolutely everything you make to us? We want to do it. <laughs> yes. <Please>. Yes. <laughs> I want to do a shout out, by the way, to like awesome a friend filmmakers are in the room. Um, you have Saad uh, right here, and who's an amazing documentary filmmaker, uh, also a Pakistani filmmaker who lives here, um, makes a lot of doc work. Um, won Hot Docs uh, pitch competition at uh, TIFF two years, excuse me, at Hot Doc in, in Toronto. Sorry, at Hot Docs with his project, and then you have Michelle over here next. Uh, who made this amazing, who's a producer, has worked on so many things I can't even tell you, but she could probably tell you. Um, what is from Toronto, now lives in New York, total badass. Made a viral video, by the way, that had 26 million views. I'm sure you saw it about this amazing Iranian couple who's like 90, 100 years old. And my favorite scene is like the, the, the dad, the, the man the, of the couple who like starts and he's like this, and he's like, huh? You know what I'm talking about. Anyway, amazing. <laughs> Uh, so I just, they came to support and are awesome, both Pakistani, like, badass filmmakers, so know them. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> oh, we're done. Right? No, sorry. <laughs> And that concludes our Q&A, Fazia. <laughs> Fazia, thank you so much for of being course, here with thank us. Of course, thank you for having me. so all much fun. You're all so lovely. <laughs> Guys, thank you all for attending. Please Woo. stay tuned for our upcoming events like our Coffee With series uh, with industry professionals and our alumni event, Monkey Business, this December at the Masterclass for Doc. Uh, follow Fusion on our social media at Fusion Film Fest on Instagram uh, for updates. And again, submissions open to the festival on November 1st and they close on February 15th, uh, 19th. Visit our website, fusionfilmfestival.com for more information. Have a wonderful night, you guys, and safe travels home. Thank you again.